Hi, and welcome everyone to Microsoft Ignite 2022. My name is Susie Kalusis. I'll be your host today. And joining me is Alvaro Vida. Alvaro is Microsoft's worldwide cybersecurity lead for public sector, and he'll be sharing his insights, best practices on securing a hybrid workplace across government. Alvaro, it's so good to see you. Hi, Susie. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. So let's just jump right in. So here's our agenda. Three things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the trends, what's involved with securing that hybrid workspace. Then we're gonna move a little bit more into those needs and challenges from the security side of things. We're gonna wrap with enabling your collaborative hybrid workspace, leveraging the value of the intelligent cloud. So real quick, Alvaro, hybrid workspace. What do we mean when we talk about hybrid workspace? Yeah, so hybrid workplace is a work model that takes into account working from home or remotely from anywhere and working at the office. Perfect. Makes perfect sense to me. That's what we do every day, right? Um, so let's jump right into some of those trends that you've uncovered as you've been working with governments. Sure, absolutely. So when we look at the hybrid workplace trends across government, let's look at it first from an employee's perspective. And then we look at it from an organizational perspective. So from an employee's perspective, Susie, so uh, based on a survey that was done by Accenture uh, across 10 different industries and 10 different countries, um, as it relates to government specifically, we look at federal government, for example, employees, and you look at 69% of them believe their jobs can be done from home remotely, just as effectively in their house or in their remote uh, workspace as they do in their office, which is something that makes total sense. I do that myself. 76% yeah. so see, indicate that productivity has improved dramatically working from home. Of course, you don't have to go in, uh, get on the, uh, on the traffic lane. You don't have to do your hair like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and lose all of that time to go into the office. And then the third, uh, thing that was interesting that was found was that 85% believe their work from home has improved their quality of life, right? And that of their families. Of course, if you don't have to commute, hello, you can play with your kids, you can have dinners together, you can have more quality time together as a family, and then it makes the employees happier, of course, and that leads to more productivity. So 80% of them say, listen, I was able to take on more tasks and more role working in this new model than I was before. So they become more productive organically. I couldn't agree more. And, and I, I can relate to these benefits, right? As a full-time working mom. And that time that I used to use for commuting, I now can use that to really, you know, strategize, think more deeply about the tasks that I have a responsibility for. So these are great stats. And I'm really thrilled to see that um, 85%, wow, really believe that it's improved their quality of life and happy employees are productive employees, as you said. So can we talk a little bit now about some of the security trends that maybe you've uncovered as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So looking at the employee's viewpoint, we also have to marry that with the security trend realities in the hybrid workplace environment. Okay, so the first thing is, Susie, there's been a 300% surge in identity-related attacks last year. Wow. Which is incredible, right? That's yeah, threefold. Yeah, 300%? Huh. A 130% increase in ransomware attacks have been tracked by Microsoft in the last year alone. Right, um, sixty-one percent rise in phishing attacks compared to last year. So those people clicking on those emails uh, that are coming in with promises of fortune, or you know, you have a check here waiting for you, or Nigerian <laughs> prince giving you millions yeah. of dollars for no reason. Right, so be careful. And then, lastly, there's been a forty-four percent increment over the last two years in insider threats. So these are people within an organization, whether maliciously or intentionally um, going in and you know, abusing their access 
for nefarious reasons or accidentally as well. Wow. Alarming stats, Alvaro. Wow. A lot to think about. Thank you, Alvaro. So no we've been looking at this from trends, security risks, right, from an employee point of view, as you said. So we talked about those benefits. Let's turn to that organizational view, if you will, for now. Are there any specific areas um, we need to be considering as our customers deploy their hybrid work environment? Absolutely. So from an organization's point of view, as you can see, there's a lot of benefits to the employees working in a hybrid work model, right? But now we have to look at this, oh, okay, what are the organizational needs from a security perspective that is in this hybrid work model? Well, first of all, they need to secure identities and access everywhere all the time, right? Because of what you saw, threefold increase in identity-related attacks. I need to ensure that no matter what, whether I'm at the office, whether I'm at home, whether I'm in my phone, if I'm accessing my organization's applications and data, I need to ensure that the identity that is used, which is the first entry point, is secure. Then yeah. I need to make sure one that the, the second need that comes up a lot, Susie, when I'm talking to government organizations, is I need they need to defend government furnished equipment as well as personal devices, right, from attacks, whether I'm working at home, at a Starbucks, or in the office, right? Because these are the devices that house. Uh, the some data, and that also has the applications that you will be using to access that data, right? Yeah. So these are prime targets. And so they need to make sure that they protect these devices, regardless of whether they own it, meaning it's government furnished equipment, or it's your own personal device that you're using from home to access an internal SharePoint site, to get on a Teams call, and so on and so forth. The third area of need is the need to protect sensitive employee and citizen data from internal or external threats, right? There are not only privacy regulations, right, but there are also compliance needs and laws that you need to adhere to to ensure that that data is well protected. Again, from yeah. insiders, people that handle this data so that they don't misuse it, right? And they take care of it. And also from external adversaries that are trying to exfiltrate this data for nefarious or monetary purposes. The fourth area, Susie, is the whole infrastructure, the whole hybrid infrastructure that all of these hybrid workplaces sit on top of. The Azure environment, the M365 environment, the networking, the storage, uh, the, the, the VMs, every single thing that is horizontally a foundational element of this infrastructure needs to be safeguarded, right? So that the infrastructure can function adequately and without interruption. Wow, I can relate to this slide, right? I, I worry about my identity to now I've, I've been hacked multiple times. So I, I, that makes sense to me, having I, that control, right, at an organization um, to ensure that the right people are accessing the right data resources, right, that they need and the day-to-day -to, -day to complete their, their task as they do their job. Um, are there additional considerations, challenges, that you can also speak to, or is this just it? Are these the, the only needs that they need to be thinking about as they're standing up that hybrid work environment? So as we talk about security needs for an organization, there are complexity, there are challenges that uh, being in a hybrid workplace brings to an organization that they need to take into account, right? And, and some of these right. challenges are realities that these organizations face when trying to secure this environment. So what are some of these? So for example, 80% of breaches, Susie, involve the use of lost or stolen passwords. Hmm. 
right? Wow. 60% of bring your own devices are not secured by IT. In other words, so if IT, an organization doesn't have control of these devices, how do you go about protecting these devices that you're using at home? A laptop that I bought at Best Buy or on Amazon and I'm using it now, how do I protect that if it's not part of my IT ecosystem? Yeah, good point. 67% of cyber attacks target remote workers. So these are prime targets that these bad actors are going after. 67%, mm. right? Three-fourths of all the targets that they go is, oh, wait a second, these people are working from home away from the safety of their organization, easy money. Let me go after these people. The other challenge is 34%, Susie, of all data breaches are caused by insider threats. So a third of all breaches are caused by the people that are inside my organization. Hmm. That's alarming. And that is alarming and something to take into account, but that sometimes gets, gets forgotten. The other element, the last element or challenge to think about is the fact that 49%, so half of nation-sponsored intrusion efforts were against government agencies. So they're the target. So these are nations attacking other nations, right? And they primarily target government agencies to cripple their ability to function within a particular country, right, and provide services to their citizens. And so these are the challenges that we need to take into account, Susie, to be able to make sure that this hybrid workplace works in a secure fashion. So what can organizations do, Alvaro? I mean, this, uh, this, this threat landscape looks intense. Sure thing. So there's a lot of things that they can do, but First, you have to have some kind of an approach, some kind of a framework, right? And this security framework or approach we call zero trust. And there are three primary principles to zero trust that allows a government organization to secure these hybrid workplaces. The first one, verify explicitly whether you're coming from an employee's workstation and it's an employee that you know and love, you have to verify that he or she is who she or, or he say they are, right? Continuously. Then as they get into the organization, you have to apply a least privileged access model. In other words, ensure, Susie, that they are accessing the right data, in the right applications at the right time when they need it. When they don't need it, that access is revoked. And so, for example, if you need access to a very critical application, you only need that access, let's say, uh, once a month to make some maintenance or changes on that application. There's no need for you to have that access 24-7. What for? All you're yeah. doing is creating a gigantic window for an adversary to come and try and penetrate those defenses, right? So right. we call that just, just enough access, just in time. And then lastly, Susie, is it doesn't matter how good your security is, you have to assume breach. You have to assume mm -hmm. that either these adversaries are already in your organization or that they will in the near future. And doing so allows you to prepare for and a situation where you are trying to contain the damage, right? So if they get into the house, they get to a very small room of the house and they're not able to move across all the rooms in the house, right? And, and that way what you're doing, Susie, is you're minimizing the blast radius, right? Yeah. And minimizing the impact so that the organization as a whole can continue to operate normally. What is it that zero trust is then what what is what is the strategy defined well zero trust is essentially so see a proactive approach where you're integrated all the security elements across all layers mm -hmm. in your digital state that explicitly and continuously verifies every transaction it doesn't matter who is it from even from your employees 
and asserts a least privileged access model and relies on AI-powered security to detect and respond to these threats as they occur. This approach has to have an architecture behind it, right? That puts the right elements in place that you can then go ahead and implement. So let's talk about this zero trust architecture. So first you have identities, right? Mm -hmm. These are human and non-human identities. This is, you know, the Susie K credential that I put in, the username that I put in to log in to Teams or SharePoint right. or into my right. laptop to be able to access application, right? Then you have the endpoint, right? Again, mm -hmm. corporate or my personal, because I could be able to use both to access organizational data and applications. And within Zero Trust, for identities, for example, I need to be able to say, well, how do I know Susie is who she says she is? Well, I do something like uh, a uh, Microsoft Authenticator app on her phone that mm -hmm. she's able to, when she logs in, I request more information from her. She can punch in that, in that phone her PIN or use her biometric, her face recognition and say, oh, okay, yeah, that is Susie, and approve that request, right? right? Very fine in turn that you say you are who you say you are, okay? Mm -hmm. On the endpoint side, what we want to make sure we do is we say, I want to evaluate the device compliance on that device. In other words, does that device have the latest operating system, the right patches, the latest antivirus, once I do that, I, the policy that I have in the zero trust um, framework that I have, the policy engine will evaluate that and mm -hmm. will enforce based on what it finds, right? So if it finds, for example, that the device is not compliant, it may not allow the device to authenticate into the environment. Now, you need to have a policy optimization, meaning you need to continuously be able to understand, oh, okay, what is my baseline? And how do I marry that security baseline to ensure that it doesn't slow down productivity? Because Susie is coming back from vacation, she needs to start working. So how do I make sure she does it in a way that is quick? I let her know, hey, listen, update your device. That took you, you know, five, 10 minutes. You update your device and you're ready to rock and roll, productive. We don't stop you from working all day, right? We don't say, no, right. your device is dead. Sorry, you're going to have to send your new device. That doesn't make any sense. So that's the ability of making sure that we take into account productivity, mm -hmm. right? So that we can mm -hmm. enable agility in, in, in your work, while at the same time protecting the organization's assets and protecting you, right? Right. The other thing that happens here, Susie, is that we want to make sure that we have an ability to protect against threats by assessing the risk. So we take into account not only your identity, your device, but where are you connecting from? Well, Susie usually connects out of Redmond, but today she's connecting out of South Korea. Well, that is yeah. an Why anomaly. Why is Susie in South Korea? <laughs> yeah. She's obviously vacationing, right? Yeah. But why is she there? And so that may ask you, the policy engine that we have grabs intelligence from all of the different, you know, uh, signals that we have, 43 trillion signals we get on a daily basis, right? From different security pillars. And we grab that in and we make decisions in milliseconds based on that session that you have and the risk based on this, all this demographic information, your identity, your device health, where you're connecting from, the application that you're accessing, the data uh, sensitivity that you're trying to access, all of this determines that, right? And then based on that, we say, oh, okay, she's trying to access 
a particular uh, database that is sitting on a private network, right? So we can do traffic filtering and segmentation, and this should be part of your zero trust architecture. Um, so with this micro segmentation, you're able to say, well, I don't want to mix my front end application data with my back end database, right? I want to make sure that I filter different traffic depending on the needs of that traffic, but I don't mix it all together because of what we're talking about before. I don't want to, I don't want to give you the keys to see to my whole house. Right. I just want to give you, you know, you're a contractor working on and on my bathroom. Here's the keys to the bathroom. Do what you need to do there, but you're not going to get into my master bedroom where I have all my jewels and all my very expensive uh, processions. You're just going right. to stay in the bathroom, right? So we want to make sure that we micro segment that so that, again, we prevent and we contain that blast radius so that they don't get into other areas of the organization. From there, one of the things that we need to take into account is said, okay, once they get to the data, we want to make sure that that data is classified properly. Is this confidential data? Is this restricted data? Is this data that is public in nature? And depending on that data, you know, we encrypt that data. We have specific role-based access controls to it, right? right? Across emails, across documents, across structured data in general, right? So that regardless of the data lifecycle, where that data goes, we always have it protected and we know who has access to it because we classify it and we label it, okay? On the app side, as you're accessing apps, we wanna make sure that we use adaptive access so that if you're accessing SaaS or on-premise applications, in real time, we can say, oh, okay, well, depending on the sensitivity of that data and depending on the type of data that that apps holds, I'm, I may request additional information from you. Maybe you need to provide me MFA. Maybe you need to, okay. uh, maybe I need to deny that access because, you know, your identity is connecting from a location that we don't allow you to based on the sensitivity of that app. As you're going into the infrastructure, right, um, whether that is, you know, containers, IS pass, or internal sites that you may have, we want to make sure to have runtime control. Right, so that we can say uh, on a just-in-time basis where you can access different areas and different systems. Now, all of these, Susie, all of these security signals that get generated gets fed back, all that's telemetry, gets fed back into our threat protection mm. and so that we can do policy optimization so that we can measure and we can continuously adapt to new threat vector and continuously refine. This is an ongoing, continuous optimization cycle that keeps going. <laughs> well, You're said. probably wondering, Alvaro, dude, that's a lot of awesomeness, a lot of architecture and fancy colors. But does Microsoft have products in each of these zero trust areas? Mm -hmm. right that i may already own as a customer or that i need to get in order to have a cohesive uh enabler to this architecture cohesive sorry let me repeat that a cohesive set of capabilities across all of this architecture so the answer is yes Susie. right so we have a security suite that is an integrated best of breed solution that shares security signals across the whole zero trust uh, architecture and across the six pillars of zero trust, right? So identity, endpoints, network, infrastructure, apps, data, all of that together. And the beauty of these um, security suites from Microsoft is that it's not siloed in nature. It's not a standalone set of solutions, right? These are products that are continuously talking to each other and passing information to each other so that the sum of these parts are greater than each individual product, right? And so that you can get all of this awesomeness of security uh, enrichment of security signals as a person or a device is moving across each of the different areas of security. 
so is there a proven approach though that you've that you've leveraged in the past to to really make this strategy this architectural view real can can you can you walk us through that absolutely yes yeah, so one thing to understand uh, and this gets forgotten sometimes and it's a common malpractice that i see as i visit and i've deployed all kinds of security solutions across customers is that just having the security products just being in the cloud doesn't mean that you're secure right mm -hmm. you still need to plan design implement and operationalize these elements together right not on their own together as a whole in order for you to be able to leverage the security ROI that you want. Let's go through some of those. So first of all, you need to assess your current zero trust posture. Where am I at? Where do I have blind spots? Where do I have gaps that I need to remediate, right? In order for me to understand where I need to get to, I need to know where I am, right, So, see? so once I assess that, I need to say, oh, okay, wait a second. I need to remediate these glaring gaps that I have in my security posture. But I need to do it in a way that I prioritize specific areas that I need to, need to remediate short term right away. Then after you remediate, you plan and say, oh, OK, as I'm remediating the quick low hanging fruit things that will give me quick security ROI, I need to plan my zero trust roadmap. What does my roadmap look like so I can get to a state that is optimal as it relates to zero trust? And then from there, I can continue to optimize. The next part of that is implement. Once I plan, once I prioritize, I go ahead and implement the zero trust roadmap. But you're implementing in an agile methodology, meaning you go ahead every week, every two weeks, every three weeks, depending on you know, your resources, your timing, and, and the amount of, of budget that you have. And then lastly, you want to optimize. You want to continuously measure the effectiveness of what you're doing, right? In an yeah. agile manner, again. Five-step approach, love it, get it, it's simple. Normally, normally I'm a three-pronged gal, but here, five steps, it fits. And especially that optimize point. Right. It reinforces, as you're saying, Alvaro, that importance of continuously monitoring and measuring your zero trust posture. OK, so we talked about. You know what it's like for a, an employee, we moved into what does an organization need to consider when they're standing up the uh, secure hybrid work environment. We reviewed the architecture, talked a little bit about, you know, you don't have to rip and replace, but it's about bringing forward those, those investments that you've already made and continuously monitoring, leveraging this approach to optimize for that zero trust um, ideal posture. How do we get started? Sure. So we have a link here where you can go and just like in our five-step approach, you need to understand where you are at and where you may have gaps before you embark on this journey. So go to this website here where you can evaluate your zero trust security posture and it'll come out maybe after five minutes or so of answering questions with mm -hmm. a series of recommendations, right? That you can do in your environment uh, that you can start looking at as areas you can focus on to remediate. As the data comes out, I what I usually do, this is just something I create. I'll give you an example of what I usually do. It's just my creation, uh, but mm -hmm. you can you can use it. Um, as you see on the screen here is, is a table where I categorize the different recommendations, put it into a category, and this, then I use this formula for risk. I said, oh, okay, wait a second. Where are the areas, because I cannot do it all, where are the areas that have the most amount of high risk to my organization? Where has the minimal impact to my employees if I were to implement it, right? Yeah. Which is important. You don't want to mm -hmm. bother your employees. But two, 
that doesn't require a lot of effort. So low effort, low impact to my employees from a productivity perspective, but high risk. And that is where I focus. And I say, oh, my goodness. Then I start um, assigning a priority for implementation. I say, oh, okay, over the next two weeks, these are the things. Obviously, the bubble to the top with the highest risk, lowest impact to employee productivity, and lowest um, effort to implement. And then I go from there, you know, what are medium, what are high, and that's how I create my roadmap, and that's how I start prioritizing. Because you cannot do it all, right? right without affecting your end user population potentially productivity wise and you only have a limited amount of resources to do things and right. you have already projects going on right and yeah. so this yeah. is this is something that i usually use to facilitate that so alvaro thank you so much for sharing that example um i get it totally understand the the value of a zero trust posture a healthy zero trust zero trust posture. Um, but just as we move to our close today, um, I encourage you, please visit the Microsoft Public Sector Center of Excellence for additional resources and continue the conversation. There you'll see um, a series of assets. I took in, uh, a screenshot for you. Type security into the um, search and you will be presented with a slew of thought leadership, video narratives, um, case studies, uh, where you'll, you'll continue to learn from not just Microsoft um, subject matter experts, but also um, your peers. So that concludes our presentation today on Microsoft's uh, point of view on how you can secure a hybrid work um, environment for yourself. Uh, thank you, Alvaro, for joining me, sharing your expertise. I learned a lot today, found the session extremely informative. But as we wrap, any final word or, or guidance for our customers today? It's my pleasure, Susie. Um, all, all to say that I'm on LinkedIn. You can follow me there. And I will continue to post information around uh, cybersecurity and government, including podcasts, white papers, blogs. Um, so if you're interested in cybersecurity and government, follow me and you'll get a lot of insight into that space. Thank you again, Alvaro. Thank you everyone for joining us. Cheers and have a great day. Thank you, Susie. Have a great day. Take care.